Uh, and that means that the Congress itself doesn't have much control. The people doesn't have much. To, they don't have much to say about it either. The control of overall policy is really in the hands of a very small number of people who control all the administrations, all the appointments to cabinets, and certainly all the appointments to the Federal Reserve. Two prime ruling class organizations are the Council of Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. Not only are Clinton and almost all of his cabinet members from these two tiny elite organizations, key military leaders, businessmen, bankers, and mass media personnel also participate. Very important experts are part of this uh, 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 power elite that we're talking about as well. And, and what I'm then saying is that, that councils on foreign relations, committees for economic development and so on, actually have basically a monopoly of the respectable expertise in the United States. The people that are sound and sensible. These are, are all in quotes, respectable. Right. For example, Reinhold Niebuhr, who's a much respected moralist and political thinker and very, very influential and among modern political leaders, uh, wrote that rationality belongs to the cool observers, uh, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason but faith. And the naive faith of the proletarian requires necessary illusion and emotionally potent oversimplifications which have to be provided by myth-makers to keep the ordinary person on the right course. Underneath the table, locked behind closed doors, they decide our future, but it might be mine and yours. They don't look now, but we're standing on the brink. The clock is ticking faster. The one subject which the establishment media will definitely not present to you is the American power structure. But we have no such taboos, so we will provide you with such information in the first of our two-part series, the American Power Structure Update, right now on Alternative Views. wonder why things stay pretty much the same in the United States, regardless of whom you vote for or whether it's Republican or Democrat in the White House? Well, it's all by design. And it goes back all the way to the development of the United States Constitution. This is the way the Constitution was set up, by reading the Federalist Papers. They were very preoccupied with this. and because they were concerned about the fact that the economic system placed the money and property into the hands of a few, they knew that those who didn't have it would want to get it. And so, in addition to the things you were talking about by limiting voting and participation in government, they continuously mentioned the fact that the government must have in it flaws. It must have flaws so it cannot work efficiently. It cannot respond to any popular will might come along. John Jay, in his, who was our first Chief Justice, said it, and I think it would have been a consensus um, in the early years among those who were in power. Those who own the country ought to run it. The world is governed by very different personages from what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes. And what I found standing behind these individuals, I believe, are large, large corporations, large foundations, a series of research institutes, a series of policy discussion groups that make it so that a David Rockefeller uh, is not merely an individual, but is in fact constantly 
um, involved, whether it's with a bank or his foundation or policy discussion group like the Council on Foreign Relations, and then one begins to see that there's an ongoing institutional structure. And so that even then when David Rockefeller retires, you see that the people that now run Chase Manhattan Bank, that now are the directors of the Council on Foreign Relations, continue to be the people that run uh, uh, the country. Clinton sits on the White House seat while many work to ensure his defeat. But only few know that he's on the third row of the American power elite. On this Alternative Views, we're going to take a look at the American power structure, particularly as it relates to successive presidential elections and administrations. One of our most popular programs, the most mind-boggling, mind-opening programs, was one we did. It was number 269. It was about the American power structure, and it really opens the minds of a lot of people to how the American economic and political system works. Well, we're going to look at the Clinton administration and see how it differs, if at all, from those of the previous Republican administrations and Jimmy Carter's administration. As far as where the prime decision makers come from, is Clinton any different from anybody else or is it really a change like the American people thought they were voting for? Warren Christopher is Secretary of State, a longtime member of the power elite. He was an attorney for a significant law firm, and he represented Exxon in a pollution case. He helped E.F. Hutton regarding a check floating scheme and lobbied for European chemical conglomerates. He served on the board of Lockheed and Southern Cal Edison. He lied about not knowing about U.S. military intelligence spying on domestic dissidents. And he helped Clinton pick Gore as his vice presidential running mate. Roger Altman is Deputy Secretary of Treasury. He's an investment banker, vice chair of Blackstone Group, which is one-fifth owned by Nikko Securities, a Japanese outfit, specializing in mergers and acquisitions, particularly by foreign corporations. He brokered several of the biggest acquisitions by Japanese firms, including CBS Records and Columbia Records. He oversaw the Blackstone Fund that financed leverage buyouts. He also was a Treasury official under Carter, and he helped to manage the federal bailout of Chrysler. He was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations along with Les Aspen, the first Secretary of Defense. Lloyd Cutler was the replacement for the President's legal advisor. He's from a prominent Washington law firm a member of the CFR, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderbergers. You know that Clinton was in trouble if he had to haul in a heavy from the power elite like Lloyd Cutler. Anthony Lake, National Security Advisor, had a high position in the Carter administration and is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, along with Strobe Talbot, Deputy Secretary of State, who was brought in when Christopher got too old and too ugly. Zoe Baird was Clinton's first choice for attorney general. She belongs to none of these elite organizations, but she's a protege of Lloyd Cutler, who is. She was employed by General Electric and a long time by Aetna Life, during which time she worked for several legal reforms which would help corporations and hurt individuals. Jeffrey Garton holds the Commerce Department's top trade position. See a man of the people? Huh. He's a partner of the Blackstone Group, an investment bank, along with Robert Altman. He's also a member of the CFR. Henry Cisneros used to be a man of the people, working for the interests of poor Latinos and migrant workers, but then he became a lobbyist for corporate interests. He's a member of the CFR and Clinton's Conservative Democratic Leadership Council. Bobby Inman, who was Clinton's first choice for the replacement for Secretary of Defense, is also from the Council on Foreign Relations. But Bobby decided to stay home and enjoy life instead of going to Washington, as Donna Shalala did, the Secretary of Department of Health and Human Services. She has a Wall Street background. She was also a Chancellor of University of Wisconsin, where she favored affirmative action and multicultural education, but she also tried to prohibit free speech on campus. Vice President Al Gore 
has only recently received the stamp of approval from the CFR. David Gergen has been there a while. Now he's replacement press secretary, and he held the same position under Ronald Reagan. Madeleine Albright is a member of the CFR, uh, which is traditional for ambassadors to the UN. She strongly supports the UN as a medium to advance U.S. interests, especially as global policemen. Here's an appointment that really shows how things work. Tarullo has a top trade position in the State Department, but he was partner in the New York law firm that represented the Mexican government during NAFTA negotiations. James Woolsey is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. That's nothing new. All the heads of the CIA have been a member of that elite organization. According to Progressive Magazine, he feels at home in the extreme right wings of both the Democratic and the Republican parties. Here's a good example of another way the Council on Foreign Relations works through the power elite. Retired General John Vesey was sent as a special envoy to Vietnam for MIAs. It was just a one-time job, not a permanent position. Here's a man who's had his head in the trough for many years. Lloyd Benson supported all the Reagan-Bush tax bills and other Reaganomics bills. He's received praise and assistance from top corporate lobbyists and trade groups, got millions of dollars from PACs. He also was involved in a failed SNL, which had mafia connections. Although he's not a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, he has attended a Bilderberger meeting. We'll talk more about these organizations, the CFR and the Bilderbergers, later in the program. When Thomas Pickering was ambassador to El Salvador, he secretly helped raise over $1 million for the Contras, although it was illegal. Here's the king of sleaze, Ron Brown. He was a lobbyist for a Washington law firm. He lobbied for Haitian dictator Baby Doc Duvalier and that nefarious bank BCCI, plus many Japanese companies. He's offered to recuse himself from cases with old clients for only one year. Stories abound about his using his positions as head of the Democratic National Committee in the law firm to enrich himself and the Democrats. James Jones, ambassador to Mexico, is a perfect example on how the system works. He was head of a Council on Foreign Relations study group about NAFTA, and then he was appointed ambassador to Mexico. Mickey Cantor is a trade representative, another D.C. lawyer and lobbyist. He represented Philip Morris, Occidental Petroleum, Martin Marietta, Arco, and many others. He lobbied for Occidental to drill off the Pacific Palisades shore. Leon Panetta is a deficit hawk. Frank Wisner, the prospective Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, is a good example of how things really don't change much. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he also was a Bush top official, being the former Undersecretary of State for International Security Affairs. Robert E. Rubin, National Economic Council Chairman, is another investment banker, co-director of Goldman Sachs and Company. He's worth $130 million himself. He fought banking reform, defends speculation and leveraged buyouts, and for the last 10 years it was said that he promoted and defended the most destructive practices of Wall Street. Alice Rivlin, the budget director, is another CFR member, as is Laura Tyson, even though she's not a mainstream free trade economist. She does believe in government support and promotion of industries. Samuel Berger is Deputy National Security Advisor. In addition to being a member of the CFR, he's a lawyer with an elite Washington law firm and one of Toyota's chief lobbyists. A fellow member of the CFR, Bruce Babbitt, the Secretary of Interior, is praised by citizens' organizations, but he's also a member of the Conservative Democratic Leadership Council. Bill Clinton was co-founder and chairman of the Democratic Leadership Council, whose goal was to wrest control of the Democratic Party from the liberals and make the party more conservative. This he has done. So we haven't really received much change under Clinton. His appointments are still the same old elites and the same old lobbyists. As a matter of fact, the Wall Street Journal said, the only real difference between these lobbyists advising the Clinton transition team 
and their Republican predecessors during the Reagan-Bush administrations is that the Democrats are making a greater effort to be discreet about their role in light of Mr. Clinton's criticism of lobbyists during the campaign. One of the most prominent modern American political scientists, Harold Laswell, who's a leading figure in uh, communications and such things, uh, he wrote the article on propaganda in the International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences, which was published in 1933. Uh, and in it, he says that we should not succumb to democratic dogmatisms about men being the best judges of their own interests. They are not. Uh, the best judges are the elites, us smart guys, the cool observers, and we must therefore be ensured the means to impose our will for the common good, of course. I wrote a little speech and gave a speech right before I left Congress, and I said I don't think the members of Congress uh, really know how little effect they have in controlling things. Really, uh, the, and that means that the Congress itself doesn't have much control. The people doesn't have much. To, they don't have much to say about it either. The control of overall policy is really in the hands of a very small number of people who control all the administrations, all the appointments to cabinets, and certainly all the appointments to the Federal Reserve. Underneath the table, locked behind closed doors, they decide our future, but it might be mine, yours. The bedrock organization of the American power structure, particularly in relationship to the political sphere, is the Council on Foreign Relations. We'll see how our leaders and policy originate within the CFR. It's mainly the New York, the Wall Street bankers and lawyers who control the steering uh, and advisory committees of it. What they have done over the years um, is basically to do several things. First, set U.S. foreign policy. Second, determine what is acceptable in the way of policies and what is discussable in the proper governmental circles. They've also been very important in, in the determining a consensus and eliciting a consensus from the upper class. Not only just the immediate uh, post-war policy, but also the extended post-war policy, including the uh, policy toward Vietnam, Guatemala, and Cuba. The International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, these ideas were hatched from the Council of Foreign Relations and accepted by the U.S. government. Some of these were the U.S. entry into World War II, determining U.S. world area of interest, the decision to drop the atomic bomb, the Marshall Plan, United Nations, International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. These ideas were all hatched in the Council on Foreign Relations. The origination of NATO, the post-war policy towards Soviet Union, China, Germany, and South Africa, the decision to end the Vietnam War was decided in the CFR. The conduct of the Cuban Missile Crisis was determined by CFR people. When the government would have various special advisors, most of these people would be from the Council of Foreign Relations. The Nixon administration is a good example because in it, there were 110 Council on Foreign Relations members participating. Now, as far as the CFR itself, in one year alone, 1965, of the 1,400 people in the organization, 176 were currently in government and 400 more previously. Now, let's look at previous administrations. If you look at the State Department, there are six men since, uh, uh, well, from the Eisenhower administration to the present. Uh, six men have been Secretaries of State. All of them have been on the Council of Foreign Relations. One of them was on the Trilateral Commission, and four were Bilderbergers. Secretary of Defense, there were eight men, six from the Council of Foreign Relations. Two were Bilderbergers, two from the Trilateral Commission, and on and on like this. So even the CIA, the seven directors of the CIA, Five were from the Council of Foreign Relations, one was a Bilderberger, and uh, one of the uh, persons who was the head of the CIA actually helped to establish the Bilderberg Organization. And the National Security Advisor, there are nine men, eight from the Council of Foreign Relations, six are Bilderbergers, and one also from the Trilateral Commission. We've taken a look previously at the Clinton cabinet and the members in the Council on Foreign Relations. Here are some of the other positions that are occupied by CFR people. There are the high positions in the State Department and ambassadors to various countries. Here are some other people who are in the Defense Department who are members of the CFR. 
Note that the Supreme Allied Commanders and the Superintendents of the Military Academy at West Point have all come from the CFR. And look at the businessmen who are members of the organization. These are all people who hold high positions in the oil industry and some of the other positions in industry. Notice also that there are some familiar names that have been in high government positions in previous administrations. Particularly notice how pervasive the CFR membership is in the elite banks of the United States. This is very significant because it is control of the banks which gives control over so many of the other major corporations in the United States. Take a look at the media members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Every network anchor, except one, is a member of the CFR. Note that all these people are members of the organization. They never report on it. It's interesting to hear the perspective of William Domhoff. He has a professor who has written the most extensively uh, than any other American about power in the United States. He wrote the book, uh, Who Rules America? Who Rules America Now? And many others. You have to look at where the decision makers come from mm -hmm. to see if the prime decision makers come from this ruling class or the people whom this ruling class is selected to right. work. I think that that's another very useful way of, of understanding about power uh, because it's the most visible to us. That is, we can watch people. We may, we right now are not, we don't know what's being talked about and said usually at the National Security Council or in the uh, private meetings in the White House, but we sure do know who's there. And uh, to give you an example, if we take uh, the Secretary of Treasury uh, as a, an important position and we look at um, uh, a few of them. For instance, under Kennedy, uh, who ran on a, uh, a, a platform of getting the country moving again, uh, we've got to get beyond this stodgy Republican establishment, and so on. And yet, when he was elected, the person he put in charge of Treasury was a man named C. Douglas Dillon, from a man worth several hundreds of millions of dollars, who from a major investment uh, uh, house in, uh, in New York. When we jump to Jimmy Carter, who was our populist, and uh, Hamilton Jordan uh, assured us that we were going to see new faces. Uh, in fact, the person that we got as our Secretary of Treasury was a man named W. Michael Blumenthal, who was the head of Bendix Corporation, a trustee of the Council on Foreign Relations, a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development, a trustee of Princeton University, uh, and a member of the Trilateral Commission. And he becomes our Secretary of Treasury. Now, Ronald Reagan comes in, and he's going to get rid of the mess in Washington from a neoconservative perspective. But our Secretary of Treasury is a man named Donald Reagan, or was. Uh, that was his first Secretary of Treasury, as you know. And, and Donald Reagan was from Merrill Lynch. He was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development. He was a trustee of the Business Roundtable. And what I'm saying, of course, with those examples is that uh, when we look at the cabinet level appointments of the past 40 years at the least, but we could go back further, but if we look at the last 40 years, that whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, whether it's a populist or a neoconservative, whatever particular ticket they run on or ideology they run on in order to attract a coalition of voters, when they turn to the question of governing, when they turn to the question of how are they going to implement a set of policies, they do, as your question uh, suggests, they turn to the same group of people. The Council on Foreign Relations is controlled by folks of high stations. They say who's respectable and choose who's electable, but we don't know of these covert machinations. Uh, Walter Lippmann, who was the Dean of American Journalists, uh, wrote about what he called the manufacture of consent. That's where that phrase comes from. And he said that the manufacture of consent has become a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government in a revolution in the practice of democracy. And this, he thought, was appropriate because the common interests very largely elude public opinion entirely and can be managed only by a specialized class whose personal interests reach beyond the locality. 
Let's take a look at the Bush administration. Was it any different from the Carter or the Clinton? No, we see that the top decision makers still are members of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, or have attended Bilderberg meetings. But as you've said, up at the top, they're all the same people. The uh, corporate uh, executives go to and from the uh, government. They hold positions in the government. Uh, the uh, people from the uh, Trilateral Commission and the Bilderbergers and all, they're all corporate people. And uh, they have their relationships and interlocks with the banks and with uh, universities and foundations and all that. So to talk about one, so you're really talking about one source of power instead of corporation on one side and government on the other, because it's all one pot, as you said. I, I think it's become one pot. Not only that is uh, you don't have any help by, say, voting for a Democrat who may be a little more critical of large corporations. But we know Democrats are just as much in bed with big government, too. Here's a chart which shows the people in the Federal Reserve System who are from the CFR. If you look at the members of the Federal Reserve, you find out that they don't ask people like me to be on the Federal Reserve, even though I've had experience on studying the issue and been on the banking committee. They ask only the people who are casually referred to as the insiders, those from Wall Street and the banking industry, the Paul Volkers and the Alan Greenspans of the world, they're on the inside. They know how to deal with the establishment and they get these positions and therefore it is a tremendous amount of economic power falls into the hands of what we call the Open Market Committee, the Federal Open Market Committee. They control from day to day the supply of money. They become the legal counterfeiters. You know, if you and I had control of the printing press, we could do a lot of, a lot of things, you know, self-serving. That's what happens when the politicians create the central bank that, get that to control the money. Now, this control of the central bank and the money goes on regardless of which party is in power, right? It never changes. You know, uh, uh, they change a person here and there, but it's always the insiders. It's always from the same group. So if you have a Republican as president or the Democrats, they're going to get the same appointments. Appointments never change. And this can be said about the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Treasury and, and the Federal Reserve Board members. They all come from the same group. And even though, I guess naively, I th was hopeful that the same group of individuals would not have as much power under, Ron, under Ronald Reagan. So uh, either side, they're, they're the same people control it. And, you know, Ronald Reagan spoke sharply against the Trilateral Commission, but he was the first president to host the Trilateral Commission in the White House. I mean, that's how blatant it is. It's, this, it's the same group of people. We've referred several times to the Trilateral Commission. Let's go back to an older program where we talked in greater detail about the organization. Um, again, we find David Rockefeller at the very pinnacle of the Trilateral Commission. They describe themselves as a private North American, European, and Japanese initiative on matters of common concern. What they would like to do is fashion a stable world order on the, uh, after the fashion of the one uh, produced after World War II by many of the same people and certainly the same interests as represented, for instance, in the Council on Foreign Relations. The uh, kernel of the idea for the Trilateral Commission arose in uh, the head of probably its mastermind, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who's now National Security Advisor to President Carter. Uh, in 1970, he talked about um, the need for a collaboration between these three areas of the world, Japan, North America, and Western Europe. The need for collaboration to uh, face certain problems, um, obstacles to the continued expansion of the capitalist world order. By July of 1973, the Trilateral Commission was officially formed. Shortly after that, it's interesting to note, um, they had selected already um, now President Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale as missioner, uh, commissioners. They did this expressly for the purpose of running them for uh, high office in the United States. Um, 
there were certain meetings between David Rockefeller and Jimmy Carter as early as 1971 in which um, David Rockefeller decided that Carter would be the perfect person to build their hopes on. So Carter, um, Mondale, and in the Republican camp, Elliot Richardson were all invited to be commissioners uh, with the hope that the, w at least one of these people would be uh, the future president. As it turns out, of course, Carter has become president, and out of the 74 American commissioners, about 21 of them are now in the Carter administration. Cyrus Vance, uh, Harold Brown, Secretary of Defense, Michael Blumenthal, Secretary of Treasury, C. Fred Bergston, Assistant Secretary of Treasury, Warren Christopher, Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State. The list goes on and on. Uh, Warren Christopher, Richard Cooper, Lucy Wilson, Richard Holbrook, Anthony Lake, Andrew Young, surprisingly. They're convinced that there is too much democratic participation um, allowed, that there's too much. It's making economic planning of the world capitalist system very difficult for them. So one of their domestic goals is to centralize economic planning. Um, the governability of democracy, according to um, Samuel Huntington, who is a very influential person in this group depends upon an expansion of capital and continued accumulation which is virtually impossible if the people run the system. Uh, they think that an elite is much better equipped to make decisions which maximize profits. What's the crisis of democracy that they're concerned with in all of the democratic societies? Well the crisis is that uh, during the 1960s uh, large groups of people who are normally passive and apathetic began to try to enter the political arena to press their demands. Uh, and that's a crisis uh, which has to be overcome. The, the naive might call that democracy, but that's because they don't understand. The sophisticated understand that that's a crisis of democracy. Uh, the American spokesman, again Samuel Huntington, uh, wrote in his report that uh, Harry Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers. In those days, there was no crisis of democracy. Things were working just right. But in the 1960s, you got all this turmoil. I mean, young people and women and, you know, the, uh, labor. I mean, all kinds of weird people who were supposed to be sitting quietly in the corners uh, began to get involved and cause this crisis. I mean, the same crisis that arose in the 17th century and that repeatedly arises uh, when people begin to try to take advantage of the uh, uh, formal opportunities that exist. Uh, th among the terrible things that were happening during the 60s causing this crisis, they said, was that you had this group of people who they called value-oriented intellectuals. Uh, people who are concerned with things like truth and justice and all that sort of nonsense, uh, and they're opposed to the good guys, the technocratic and policy-oriented intellectuals, they called them the commissars, the ones who just do the job, you know. Uh, but you had these value-oriented intellectuals, and they were doing all sorts of horrible things like uh, undermine, delegitimizing the institutions that are responsible for the indoctrination of the young, like schools and universities. Remember, this is an internal discussion, so they kind of let their hair down. Uh, their general proposal at the end of all of this, these lengthy and thoughtful discussions was that what we need is more moderation in democracy to mitigate the excess of democracy and to overcome the crisis. Uh, in plain terms, what that means is that the public has to be reduced to their proper state of apathy and obedience and driven from the public arena if democracy is to survive in the appropriate sense with the specialized class, you know, the cool observers, us smart guys, uh, the technocratic and policy-oriented intellectuals doing our job in the interests of the people who have real power. What Huntington has realized is that the party system it can be used very effectively to uh, reduce participation. In, in his words, um, apathy is very functional. And the party system can be used, in a sense, as a rubber stamp uh, for 
policies that are made elsewhere in the system. I think it's, it's important to note that all of these groups that we're talking about have as their ideal the stabilization of the status quo, the management of the system from concern with management of the very top from the very top of the world capitalist economic order to domestically the management of the, uh, the polity here in the United States. And that, that is clearly their uh, main goal. One it? way uh, that this is to be achieved will have to be through um, restrictions on the press, the media, and they've called for uh, restoration of the law of libel for the press, which uh, uh, people associated with the media and the press know that that could be a very dangerous kind of weapon by the government against freedom of expression. Uh, the liberals, as in the Trilateral Commission, uh, all in fact agree. Uh, they, in the same study, they say that the media threaten government authority by their adversarial stance and they've got to be curbed. If they can't curb themselves, the government is going to have to move in to curb them. Curb them. Um, part of the policy is to have a kind of consensus, a coordination between the five or six major industrial uh, powers in the, in the world. Um, they see the need not only for, well, they, they recognize there's a great deal of interdependence now. They see the need for, for much more cooperation and coordination than there's been in the past. So they think that five or six key industrial states getting together can in turn dominate the major third world countries. These countries of course supply cheap resources, cheap labor, which are necessary for the industrialized countries. They recognize that the demands in these uh, third world countries are increasing for a greater share of the pie. So they advocate giving a certain degree of power control and a, a bit larger piece of the pie to certain clientele elites within third world countries. In this way, um, the in major industrial powers can control elites in third world countries, which in turn supplied liberally with um, taxpayer-funded military hardware um, would be able to subjugate their own population. What's your conclusion about the Trilateral Commission? They describe themselves. They say that they want a kind of concentric circle of decision making. And this would involve uh, these few major industrial states and, and not wide participation from these industrial states would be participation by the economic elites, such as um, David Rockefeller, of course, uh, directing. That would be the core, the central aspect of this concentric circle they talk about. Just outside that, they would involve, to a lesser extent, um, industrializing countries, the more advanced third world countries. And beyond that would be a circle of these world organizations like uh, the World Bank, the IMF, and other international agencies which would establish the, rec uh, the regulations by which third world countries and um, all other industrialized countries would be regulated. The, the hope is, of course, to coordinate, to stabilize, and to reduce competition. Clinton plays on the sax and he sings. He says he's in control of things. He'll bleat and he'll beller, but it's Dave Rockefeller who really pulls the strings. What these organizations do is they legitimate these people as fair-minded experts. You see, the interesting thing about politics in America in terms of policies as opposed to electing individuals is that the po political organizations of the ruling class are not called political. Now, this seems, uh, is this an irony? Yeah, in a way. That is, all the groups in America that are called nonpartisan, bipartisan, nonpolitical, that's the political organizations of the ruling class in America. You see, if you go out and say, I don't understand how you can talk about a ruling class. There's the Democrats over here and there's the Republicans over here. That's politics, isn't it? No, that's just deciding which individuals will fill offices. Politics in the important sense of, of which policies we all agree are, make sense, 
That happens in non-political organizations. So when uh, the Committee for Economic Development puts out a statement, it says, the Committee for Economic Development, a nonpartisan group of <laughs> yeah. business people, today suggested we alter the Social Security system in the following way. S and then they say, look, some of our members are Democrats, some of our members are Republicans, we're trying to get something that's good for all of America. We're trying to transcend politics. We're trying to do something that's, that's in the national interest. Now, once you say, yeah, that's fair, we've got to get beyond this fight between Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> they're, they're, they're people that have, they can run an organization. They're success in America. And then we identify with them because of their high status. And, and because they're part of this fair-minded organization, academic experts from Har Harvard have helped them and from Yale. And who are we? you know, to, to argue with somebody from Harvard and Yale, plus a successful business leader. And that's what we call legitimation, uh, in, in my mind, of, of their policy. This also involves experts in America, not just uh, uh, multi-millionaires and corporate executives, but very important experts are part of this uh, 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 power elite that we're talking about as well. And, and what I'm then saying is that, that councils on foreign relations, committees for economic development, and so on, actually have basically a monopoly of the respectable expertise in the United States. The people that are sound and sensible. These are, are all in quotes, respectable, right. sound, sound, sensible. Henry Kissinger being one example. Yeah, and that's Kissinger exactly is where I'm headed, sound. is to Henry Kissinger. Yeah. If we look at the career of Henry Kissinger, we, we might say, well, only in America. <laughs> uh, in one way, yes, because here is a person who's an escapee from, from uh, Nazi Germany, who by going to school here, by doing well at Harvard, we can say, look at him, he's been very important, and he has. But here is the other part of, of, of Kissinger's career that's so important. While he was at Harvard, he was uh, seen by a man named McGeorge Bundy who was the dean of the faculty, or the head of the faculty, and a, uh, from a prominent Boston family. His father is a corporation lawyer. Uh, in other words, he's a well-to-do person uh, that happened to be in the academic world. And he called his friends at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he said, you know, this guy Kissinger is a bright young guy, and he could really be useful in some of the discussion groups. And so Kissinger was invited to be in these discussion groups, and Nelson Rockefeller was really taken with Kissinger, and he basically then hired him to write things for him and to write things for panels of experts that the Rockefellers set up. Well, in the late 60s, the interesting thing is that, of course, that Richard Nixon appointed Kissinger as his foreign policy advisor. Now, the first reason that's interesting is that supposedly Nixon and Kiss and, and Rockefeller, excuse me, that Nixon and Rockefeller were so different, they had all their political conflicts, and yet Nixon was perfectly willing to hire what seemed to be, quotes, Nelson Rockefeller's man. But beyond that, the interesting thing is that uh, two years after the election, at a point when uh, Kissinger's star was, was quite high, uh, Hubert Humphrey was interviewed. Was ta they were talking about what he would have done if he was uh, uh, president. And he said, well, it's funny. He said, one of the things I was going to do was appoint Henry Kissinger. He had talked to Henry Kissinger before the election, saying, if I'm elected, will you be my foreign policy advisor? My point is, of course, whether we get Nixon or whether we get Humphrey, there was one thing we were sure we were going to get, and that was Kissinger. He was the Rockefeller man. Uh, yeah, but start. basically, by that time, of course, he's known to many of these corporate people. His expertise is very useful to them. Uh, he's been legitimated through being part of these organizations so, so. like the Council. But then let's take it down to, to what I think is uh, also interesting in terms of the continuity of, of a power structure. Let's take it down to the early 1980s, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, in part, ran on a platform that was practically running against Henry Kissinger. One of the things the very conservative Republicans do not like is what they call the Eastern Establishment, and one of their favorite pet peeves within the Eastern Establishment is the Council on Foreign Relations, and one part of that is Henry Kissinger. Well, what do we end up with, though? Within a year or two, we have Henry Kissinger as head of the President's Commission on Central America. In other words, Ronald Reagan also then hires Henry Kissinger. So when you just trace the career of that man, you then see the continuity in the power structure. But at the same time, we're back to our earlier point about, are we just talking about individuals? No, we're not, because you have to understand that Kissinger first was at a very important institution called Harvard, 
which is one of the main reservoirs of expertise, as well as a place for upward mobility, where uh, experts are seen by members of the ruling class, whether they're uh, McGeorge Bundy or whether they're trustees of the university. Then he went to the Council on Foreign Relations, where he was part of a discussion group of 20 or 30 people from all over the country, people from the CIA, people from the State Department, people from corporations, people from law firms, other academic experts. And in that situation, he, they say, this person sees the world the way we do, and he has information that's, that's very useful to us. Uh, and so it's this institutional setting that he's moved through that brings him into uh, uh, the power structure. Let's look now at the Reagan administration to see if it also was dominated by members of these elite organizations. Well, all these people listed now are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Some of them also Bilderbergers and uh, members of the Trilateral Commission. We see a continuing interest in the dominance of certain sections of the American Executive Department, Defense, Treasury, Commerce, the CIA, and, of course, particularly the State Department. We must remember, when considering this list, as well as others we've looked at, that the Council on Foreign Relations is a tiny organization, less than 2,000 people, but each member approved by David Rockefeller and uh, a handful or less of his friends. It should be pointed out, though, that these people are more conservative than their elite colleagues in the Carter. Let's look at the men who are really in the shadows the Bilderberg Organization. Well, the first meeting was in 1954 at the Bilderberg Hotel in uh, Holland. That's how they got their name. Who are they? Well, David Rockefeller is the chairman, of uh, the head man of the uh, Bilderbergers. He's also head man of the Chase Manhattan Bank, of the Council of Foreign Relations, and uh, of the Trilateral Commission. The participants are a mix of the most powerful uh, men of the transnational oil uh, sector of the world economy, the uh, multinational banks, and also the important uh, leaders of the world, political leaders. And this is supplemented by key congressmen, military leaders, representatives from the intelligence and police organizations like CIA and Interpol, the elite foundations, members of the mass media, and the Rockefeller think tanks and the, the elite uh, universities. These are people from the NATO countries, basically, and they are people like this from the U.S. who meet with their counterparts in three-day sessions, three-day meetings in extreme secrecy with great security precautions taken. Now, I say since 1954 this has been going on, and nothing has been in the television and television about it. Very, very little has been in any of the newspapers. Now, the right wing has been screaming about it constantly. What are these people doing? But the interesting thing is not only do all of these people, uh, most powerful people in the world, meeting together, but nobody knows what is happening except a little bit here and there. Uh, we can find out they do discuss working papers of various sorts like uh, uh, the uh, decline of American power or what to do about the American dollar, things like this. But basically we don't know, but there are a lot of very impressive facts about this. One is that uh, several men who were invited to attend the Bilderberg meetings later became the number one or number two men in their government of their respective countries like Gerald Ford, Helmut Schmidt, Nelson Rockefeller, Harold Wilson, uh, Edward Heath, and Walter Mondale. In addition to that, there are a lot of people who used to be powerful in the government who still meet with the Bilderbergers. Uh, and so you find a continuation of people. For instance, uh, Dean Acheson, Dean Rusk, Henry Kissinger, uh, his big nephew Brzezinski. All of these people, Republican or, administra or uh, Democratic administrations, it doesn't make any difference. They're all there with the Bilderberger the organization. This is what might be called a capitalist cartel. Basically. And these meetings are held in great secrecy, as I said. They have roadblocks, bulletproof cars. They had one meeting on an island. Before they had the meeting, they moved everybody off the island. They had another one in a ho another meeting in a hotel where they moved everybody out of the hotel, brought in all new staff, and after having security checks on the new staff, they wouldn't let them leave the hotel for the three days of the meeting. 
thing, one important aspect of the Bilderberg Group is probably that here is the place where the where consensus is effected, so that they can present a uh, a worldview that's pretty much the same and work out any any uh, problems or rough spots which they may have um, in the international uh, uh, organization. President Roosevelt knew how power was wielded. In politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. Let's turn once again to Noam Chomsky, who tells us about 17th century English revolution and the struggles of the people against elite control and the attitudes of these elites toward true democracy. That was a multidimensional affair with a civil war between the supporters of the king and the supporters of parliament, but then a big popular movement was against all of them uh, and didn't want uh, and was trying to and had a very uh, populist, radical, democratic character to it and was defeated. The Democrats were defeated within about 20 years by 1660. And you read their pamphlets, they were saying that we've lost. The only question now is whose slaves the poor shall be. Uh, king or parliament. Uh, many revolutions have the same consequence. Uh, maybe all so far, till one yet to come. Uh, uh, in the course of that struggle, there was a great deal of concern over the fact that the general population was gaining the opportunity uh, and the, even the idea of becoming involved directly in shaping their own affairs. Uh, and that led to great concerns. Uh, John Locke wrote that day laborers and tradesmen, uh, the spinsters and dairy maids, must be told what to believe. Uh, the greatest part cannot know, and therefore they must believe. Uh, one of the contemporary historians, a man named Clement Walker, uh, wrote at the time that uh, the deep concern of the liberal elements we're talking about now over the fact that uh, these guys with their little printing presses putting out pamphlets and, you know, agitating in the army and that sort of thing, uh, were beginning to reveal the mysteries of government. Uh, and he said if they do that, uh, they will make people so curious and arrogant that they will never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. That has to be stopped. Uh, and the same idea comes right up to the modern period the class structure and class nature of the United States. Now, we hear about middle class very frequently. It's written, a lot of things are studied about the middle class, and a lot of things have been written about the middle class. You see frequently lower middle class and lower, but you don't see too much written about upper class. Now, if there's a middle class, there has to be an upper, right? Okay. I think that there very definitely is an upper class in the United States, and indeed, that's been the starting point of my research, is to start with uh, social clubs, exclusive private schools, summer resorts, to start with what uh, uh, we can see if we will but look, uh, to see these people as a set of interacting and intermarrying uh, set of families who have developed a whole set of uh, social institutions that preserve their way of life. Once we have located these various schools, clubs, resorts, retreats, debutante balls, then we can understand uh, the uh, historical continuity of uh, social upper class in America. It's my belief that uh, about uh, half a percent of Americans are part of what I would call a social upper class. Uh, and these people uh, own about 20 to 25 percent of all the privately held wealth in the United States. That is, if we took all of your wealth, which might be your car, your house, your insurance policy, if we threw in your guitar, uh, everything, <laughs> we took all of that wealth, plus the stocks and bonds and real estate in America, we put all that in a big pile, 20 to 25 percent of all of that, one half of one percent of the people have that in the United States. And what my thesis basically says is that those people that have that 20 to 25 percent of all the privately held wealth are not mere individuals that are scattered here and there and are kind of rare and don't know each other, but in fact they uh, uh, are, are closely knit. They know each other, they see the world the same way, they do discuss with each other uh, the kinds of policies that they think uh, would uh, further their way of life. So in that sense we then talk about them um, in this more sociological abstract sense that uh, 
they're not just families because in fact there there are these ongoing institutional uh, kinds of structures and they are uh, uh, structures that do matter when we talk about whether uh, a group is ruling or not we have to look at um, three or four uh, indicators of power one of course is we've talked we've hit upon when we talked about wealth uh, if a group is a, a dominant group or a ruling group we would expect them to have more of what uh, people value in a society and certainly this uh, upper social class we've been talking about has more wealth it has more income uh, it certainly has access to the best best education and health care and so on so on all the measures of who benefits uh, I think there's that shows that they are a ruling class because we would all like to be a lot richer we'd all like to be a lot more secure uh, in our economic circumstance but I also think that we can show that these people are a ruling class when we look at the kinds of policies that are implemented by the uh, federal government. And these policies range from subsidies for specific corporations and industries, tax breaks, uh, a little shaving on regulations mm -hmm. and so on, on up to more general policies. Uh, policies that uh, I think basically benefit uh, large corporations as a group. And, and that means uh, kinds of, of foreign policies that maximize the possibility of in investment overseas, uh, policies at the uh, uh, domestic level that, uh, that uh, maximize the possibility of, uh, of a tranquil and happy and docile workforce, uh, numerous kinds of policy. But the most important <laughs> issue is, is power, yeah. is control. Yeah, in other words, absolutely. if I'm going to make a few million dollars less for a few years, uh, okay, but I want to keep my, my situation, I want to keep the general system running. Here are the words of Thomas Jefferson. There is an artificial aristocracy founded on wealth and birth without virtue or talents, and provision should be made to prevent its ascendancy. This is the first of our two-part series on the American Power Structure Update. Our next program will focus on several subjects included are the mass media, elections, distribution of wealth and income. Be sure to join us. We have a lot of people to thank for helping with the program. Brian Lynch, Eric Eubank, Kevin L. West. Trish Busa, Manon J. Thomason, Shannon Lorito, and Itza Gutierrez. Jackson Brown let us use a portion of his video, Lives in the Balance, and Joan Harvey let us use portions of her America from Hitler to MX documentary. The charts on the American power structure come from the Fund to Restore an Educated Electorate, P.O. Box 33339, Kerrville, Texas, 78029. That's the Fund to Restore an Educated Electorate in Kerrville. Goodbye. In totalitarian societies, it's not a big problem. You, you got a club in your hand, uh, and if people don't behave the right way, you hit them with a club or threaten them with it. So it doesn't really matter much what they think. What matters is what they do, and that you control by force. But as the capacity of the state to control by force erodes, it's necessary to control what people think. People have been conditioned that it's great to have two parties. We don't want to be like Italy where there's all these choices. We want to limit our choices. It's easier that way. And we don't want to be like Soviet Union where there's only one party. Yeah, that's right. So they have two. But if policies never change, what's the difference? So we do have one party. Well, that one year when the wealthiest 4,000 families received $4 billion in income, this was more than all government spending to feed the poor. Twice the amount of money used for anti-poverty programs and was more than all federal money spent on education. But one of the big aircraft corporations building Focke Wolves for Hitler at the same time they were building P-38s or whatever it was for the American Air Force, you know, couldn't lose because they had money invested on both sides. Many of, uh, of our own 
corporations in this country provided essential aid to the Axis forces in the Second World War. And uh, many of the technological improvements that uh, led to many of the early victories of, uh, of the Nazis in Europe and to the death of the working class in this country were the direct result of uh, our multinational corporations selling uh, technological secrets to the Axis forces through neutral countries such as Switzerland. The second in our two-part series on the subject which you'll never see on PBS or the commercial networks, the American power structure, right now on Alternative Views. first of our two-part series on the American power structure, we talked at length about three elite organizations, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, and the Trilateral Commission. If you happen to miss the last previous alternative views, here is a brief reprise of some of the high points of that program. John Jay, who was our first Chief Justice, said it, and I think it would have been a consensus um, in the early years among those who were in power. Those who own the country ought to run it. And that means that the Congress itself doesn't have much control. The people doesn't have much to say. They don't have much to say about it either. The control of overall policy is really in the hands of a very small number of people who control all the administrations, all the appointments to cabinets, and certainly all the appointments to the Federal Reserve. The world is governed by very different personages from what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes. And what I found standing behind these individuals, I believe, are large corporations, large foundations, a series of research institutes, a series of policy discussion groups that make it so that a David Rockefeller uh, is not merely an individual, but is in fact constantly um, involved, whether it's with a bank or his foundation or policy discussion group like the Council on Foreign Relations, and then one begins to see that there's an ongoing institutional structure. And so that even then when David Rockefeller retires, you see that the people that now run Chase Manhattan Bank, that now are the directors of the Council on Foreign Relations, continue to be the people that run uh, uh, the country. You look at the State Department, there were six men since, uh, uh, well, from the Eisenhower administration to the present. Uh, six men have been Secretary of State. All of them had been on the Council of Foreign Relations. One of them was on the Trilateral Commission, and four were Bilderbergers. Secretary of Defense, there were eight men, six from the Council of Foreign Relations. Two were Bilderbergers, two from the Trilateral Commission, and on and on like this. So even the CIA, the seven directors of the CIA, Five were from the Council of Foreign Relations, one was a Bilderberger, and uh, one of the uh, persons who was the head of the CIA actually helped to establish the Bilderberg Organization. And the National Security Advisor, there are nine men, eight from the Council of Foreign Relations, six are Bilderbergers, and one also from the Trilateral Commission. Clinton sits on the White House seat while many work to ensure his defeat. But only few know that he's on the third row of the American power elite. Power is a word that uh, Americans are just very uncomfortable with. Now, I must say that we know it. We know that there's the other side of the tracks and there's the people that live in the nice houses. We have all of these euphemisms that we use for uh, power structures and for social classes. I think that there very definitely is an upper class in the United States and indeed that's been the starting point of my research. If a group is a, a dominant group or a ruling group, we would expect them to have more of what uh, people value in a society. 
And certainly this uh, upper social class we've been talking about has more wealth, it has more income, uh, it certainly has access to the best, best education and health care and so on. So on all the measures of who benefits, uh, I think there's, that shows that they are a ruling class. Let's take a look at wealth and income in the United States and see how it's distributed. In the late 1950s, the wealthiest 1% of the families held 80% of all publicly held stock. And 10 years later, 0.2% of American spending units had 65 to 70% of all public stock. This means wealth. And how is the distribution of wealth in the U.S.? Well, the richest 2% of U.S. citizens had wealth greater than the U.S. gross national product. And in 1962, 0.5% of the consumer units had 22%, and 2.5% had 61% of all American wealth. What about the distribution of income? Well, income is a little bit different because wealth produces income. Most of us work for income. We don't have wealth or that much of it. So we see that in the income distribution in 1968, the top 10% had 30% of income, the top 30% had 58% of the income, the bottom 40% had 15%, and the poorest 20% of us had 4% of the income. Income is concentrated at the top, just like wealth is in the United States. During the Reagan-Bush era, there was an enormous retransfer of wealth and income from the poor and the middle class back up to the rich. In 1959, the top 4% of the families had the same as the bottom 35% in income. But in 1989, the top 4% had the same as the bottom 51%. That's Reaganomics at work. The big tax reform of 1986 was a significant part of this redistribution of wealth and income. Because if you had up to $10,000 in income, you had 11% cut in your taxes, but that only gave you an extra $37. If you had between 20 and 30,000, also 11% cut, but that was only $300. Well, look what happens when you become wealthy, 200,000 to 500,000 you got 27,600 in tax breaks. 500,000 to a million, you got $86,000 in a tax cut. And for a million dollars or more of income, a 31% decrease in your taxes, which gave you over a quarter of a million dollars in tax cut. This was supposed to trickle down to the rest of us, but it mainly was used for speculation, for building plants overseas, or just for plain, old-fashioned enrichment. What does this mean concretely? Well, that one year when the wealthiest 4,000 families received $4 billion in income, this was more than all government spending to feed the poor, twice the amount of money used for anti-poverty programs and was more than all federal money spent on education. And speaking of power, those who have it reap the riches. People sometimes call our system socialism for the rich, capitalism for the poor. Other people simply call it welfare for the rich. I've compiled a list from several books which specify just some of these special treatments which the wealthy are able to get from our system. Tax loopholes, tax-exempt property, interest-free deposits, estimated $900 billion a year. Monopoly costs, that means because these big corporations are monopolies, they can gouge the consumers, so they get anywhere from 100 to $230 billion a year in overcharges, plus the loss of regular production from 40 to $60 billion. The Interstate Commerce Commission, the Federal Maritime Commission, the Civil Aeronautics Board, they all are for business people. The timber growers, they get $100 million a year. Farm subsidies, $10 billion and 73 alone. And it's much more than that by now. Tax evasion costs the U.S. Treasury anywhere between $29.67 billion. I've seen some people who say it's as much as $200 billion. Multinational corporations can deduct 
from their U.S. taxes the operating costs of their foreign subsidiaries. Import quotas and duties also cost the American consumer anywhere from 5 to $7 billion. How about those roads for the trucking industry or the free radio and TV stations given away by the FCC? And, you know, there are interest-free government deposits in banks, but the government must pay interest to borrow money. There are export subsidies. The Pentagon costs overruns. My gosh, you know about that. And the welfare contracts to big corporations. We think that people are welfare chiselers because they're getting a few dollars a month. Well, most of that money goes to big corporations for conducting the welfare programs. You know, the government does the research and gets the program going, like NASA and the nukes and all, and then they turn it over to the corporations to get the profits and tax money which goes to the International Monetary Fund, guarantees the foreign loans to the banks. American tax money is going to be going to the banks and the savings and loans for bailouts for them. You know, tobacco will kill you, but the U.S. is supporting it, their export subsidies. Most of the executive branch goes to help business, along with many agencies for the states. Well, how about taxes? Those investment tax credits, capital gains, depletion allowances, accelerated depreciation, lower non-existent corporate tax profits, they don't pay the taxes. You do, folks. And those tax deductions, travel, country clubs, corporate lobbying, and political contributions are all deductible. And how about all the defense expenditures? Is that welfare for the rich, too? Huh. Socialism for the rich, capitalism for the poor. But as far as power is concerned, control of wealth is of prime importance. And this is done mainly through institutional investors like banks and insurance companies. In an older Alternative Views program, Professor Al Slavinsky explained. I think it's sort of along the lines of a pyramiding scheme. If you can control a corporation by controlling just a small segment of its stock, that's one thing. But if you have a bank, which through its trust departments has lots of, lots of stock and lots of companies, um, <clears throat> you can centralize your control. And this is exactly what the Rockefellers, as well as, I guess, the other 10 or 12 wealthy, mega-wealthy families in the United States learned many years ago, that you can control the corporations of the United States better, more efficiently, cheaper, the whole bit, by controlling a few financial institutions. And these banks, in turn, and these families, in turn, also form alliances with other families and banks and institutions throughout the United States. Um, Carnegie might have called Rockefeller Rockefeller, but his daughter Nancy married Rockefeller. A listing of what Noel says are some of the corporations which the Rockefellers, just the Rockefellers alone, not in consonant with uh, the Morgans or anybody else, alone which they have. DuPont, Grace, Corning Glassworks, Cummins Engine, these are just a few of them. Uh, Pittsburgh Coke and Chemical, Deering uh, Millican, Field Enterprises, Mercantile Stores, Standard Oil of New Jersey, Mobile Oil, Standard Oil of California, Standard Oil of Indiana, International Harvester, Inland Steel, Marathon Oil, Quaker Oats, Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel, Freeport Sulphur, etc., etc. Let's go to another page. Stone and Webster, Federated Department Stores, Walgreens Stores, Marshall Field. I'd like to have one of those in my yeah, sock for yeah. Christmas, and plenty of others. IBM, Texaco, ITT, Westinghouse, Boeing, Kodak, International Paper, 3M, Spray Rand, Xerox, National Cash Register, uh, National Steel, American Home Products, Fitzer, Hercules, Merck, Universal Oil Products, uh, Penn Central, TWA, Eastern Airlines, Northwest Airlines, J.C. Penney, Consolidated Freight. Oh, let's see, Anaconda. Corporation, Consolidated Edison, ATT, U.S. Steel, Monsanto, General Foods, Chrysler, Oakland, o uh, Olin Corporation, Pan American, Colgate, Palmolive, Peep, Warner, Warger, and Home Insurance, and Sears. A number of the utilities, Con Edison is, 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 is I guess it's reasonable to say, Con Edison is, is controlled by Rockefellers. Uh, at one time, the Rockefeller institutions also had 40% of the board of directors of AT&T. Rocky's folks are king of the hill. They are controlling us still. They own the big banks, the mics, and the tanks, while the people are footing the bill. Control is effected mainly through stock ownership and interlocking directorates, as indicated by Senator Metcalf's study in 1978. 
it's rather difficult for any of us to believe there's any competition taking place between two corporations that share different directors or common directors with other corporations. Uh, the study done by Medcalf only concerned the top 130 corporations in the United States, uh, but I will mention these, these 130 corporations <coughs> had assets in excess of in excess of about one trillion dollars or roughly twenty five percent of all assets in the united states in the um, industrial financial utility retail diversified financial broadcasting sectors uh... these one hundred thirty corporations had five hundred thirty direct interlocks and over twelve thousand indirect interlocks with each other frank now the top thirteen corporations 13. in the study were at&t bank america citcorp which is first national city of new york Chase Manhattan, Prudential, Metropolitan, Exxon, Manufacturers, Hanover, J.P. Morgan, General Motors, Mobile, Texaco, and Ford. Now, each of the top 13 companies reached an average of 70% of the other major companies through a total of 240 and over 6,000 indirect interlocks. And this does not include any interlocks between their subsidiaries either. Of which any, there are about 12,000 or more. Ex right? Exactly. To give an example, Bank America, which is the biggest U.S. banking company, interlocked with the next biggest bank, Citicorp, Chase Manhattan, J.P. Morgan, and with the two biggest insurance companies, Prudential and Metropolitan Life. Bank America's total 163 interlocks reached 75 of the top 130 corporations. Sit Corporation, or First National City, Sit Bank as they like to be called, uh, the second biggest U.S. banking concern, uh, <clears throat> and also the biggest international or multinational banking concern, uh, interlocked with the top banks and insurance companies, uh, plus having 21 links with AT&T, 7 links with Exxon, 12 links with General Motors, 3 with Ford, 9 with Mobile, uh, for a total of 716 interlocks, reaching 97 of the top 130 corporations. Uh, Chase Manhattan, which is an, another multinational banking concern, reached 89 of the top corporations through 535 interlocking directorates. J.P. Morgan interlocked with 99 of the top corporations through 533 interlocks, and so on it went. President Franklin Roosevelt said in 1933, the real truth of the matter is, as you and I know, that a large financial element in the large centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson. Now, the analogous situation, not analogous, but the kind of sister uh, proposition with interlocking directors seems to be stock ownership. Uh, <clears throat> banks, insurance companies, universities, pension funds are your major trust uh, common stock owners. Stock ownership is the second or sister proposition to interlocking directorates as a means of control. In the Medcalf study, J.P. Morgan's subsidiary, Morgan Guarantee and Trust Company, is the major identified stock voter in 27 of the top 122 corporations in the nation and is among the top five stock voters in 56 corporations. Second in stock voting power was First National City's uh, subsidiary, Citibank, which was the major identified stock voter, voter in seven corporations and among the top five in 25 others. Uh, Morgan Guarantee and Trust is stock voter number one in four of its New York sister banks, Citicorp, Manufacturers Hanover Chemical, Bankers Trust, as well as Bank America Corporation. And I think I've read recently in some papers that we have intensely fierce competition between Chase Manhattan and First National City for banking services in New York City. I think this is rather absurd. Particularly since they're both Rockefeller family they're banks. Both right? founded by Rockefellers, one by William and one by J.D. Uh, in turn, Citicorp is stock voter number one in Morgan Guarantee's parent holding company, J.P. Morgan and Company. Stock voter number two in J.P. Morgan and Company is Chase Manhattan. Uh, stock voters number three and four in J.P. Morgan and Company are Manufacturers Hanover Trust, and so on it goes. And without in, in other words, that the the banks which uh, have the uh, main stock holdings in all these big corporations and have the, the great amount of uh, interlocking directors with the other corporations, they are also interlocked with each other and own each other. Right. Uh, these are some of the things that we can expect from interlocking directors and also from this close-knit family of stock ownership. Uh, monopoly and destruction of competition, the ability to price fix, the ability to raise prices, control over resources, control over markets, export of jobs, uh, businesses control over the economic system and the political system, centralization of decision making, collusion, undermining democracy, reciprocal dealing, mergers, restrictions on new business fields, the blocking of expansion into competitive fields, and with financial institutions at a, as a core we have non-competitive coordinated action in extending credit and providing capital. Uh, the ability to uh, control development and direction of the entire American economy through this interlocking web of stock ownership and interlocking directors.
Now, it's the head people in these organizations that are also in the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission, and the Council of Foreign Relations. And what this report points out is that these organizations are interlocked themselves through interlocking directorates and also through stock ownership. The mayor of New York City in 1922 had a pretty clear idea of who controlled whom. The real menace of our republic is the invisible government. At the head is a small group of banking houses, generally referred to as international bankers. This little coterie virtually runs our government for their own selfish ends. The bank owns the mayor down in City Hall. The bank owns the governor, and that ain't all. There's bankers in the Senate, and everybody knows Ronald Reagan calls the bank before he blows his nose from the Washington Post to the New York Yanks. It's why these run, run by the banks. I see Morgan rock a feather, Mr. DuPont, you're so cute. Here's what Thomas Jefferson had to say about the banks. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. Already they have raised up a money aristocracy that has set the government at defiance. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the government to whom it properly belongs. Let's assess now the structure and role of the mass media in society. We turn to one of America's most outstanding mass media critics, professor and author Noam Chomsky. He's the co-author of Manufacturing Consent. If you have a society in which the voice of the people is heard, you got to make sure that that voice says the right thing. In totalitarian societies, it's not a big problem. You, you got a club in your hand, uh, and if people don't behave the right way, you hit them with a club or threaten them with it. So it doesn't really matter much what they think. What matters is what they do, and that you control by force. But as the capacity of the state to control by force erodes, it's necessary to control what people think. And in fact, I think you find much more sophisticated concern uh, for thought control precisely as the society becomes more free. I don't think it's surprising that the sophisticated discussion, uh, things like the public relations industry and uh, the academic uh, side of it and you know, the journalistic side and all these kinds of things I've been sampling, uh, I suspect if one did a comparative study, you'd find that they develop primarily in relatively free societies. Uh, ours is a very free society in the sense that the state has, by comparative standards, very limited resources to control by force. And I think it's undoubtedly, in fact, the most sophisticated in the terms of, in the reliance on techniques of indoctrination and control, public relations industry in particular as a, an American creation. Well, coming up to more modern times in the post-Second World War period, uh, you find, again, a deep concern over the need to control and deceive the public, to control the public mind. Uh, presidential historian Thomas Bailey wrote in 1948, at the time when we were sort of setting off on a new war, the Cold War, 
He wrote, because the masses are notoriously short-sighted and generally cannot see danger until it's at their throats, our statesmen are forced to deceive them into an awareness of their own long-run interests. Deception of the people may in fact become increasingly necessary unless we're willing to give our leaders in Washington a freer hand. And uh, in 1981, as the United States was launching a new crusade for freedom, uh, Samuel Huntington, the professor of government at Harvard, uh, said in a private but published discussion, uh, interchange, you may have to sell intervention or other military action in such a way as to create the misimpression that it is the Soviet Union that you're fighting. That's what the United States has been doing ever since the Truman Doctrine, which is quite accurate and gives a certain insight into the nature of the Cold War, in particular into the nature of the war against Nicaragua, which is what he specifically had in mind. Well, what is the relationship of the mass media to the Bilderbergers, Trilateral Commission, and Council on Foreign Relations? The establishment media tell us that they are the watchdogs of the system, that they are looking at it and telling us everything there is, and uh, don't worry, folks, if there's anything of significance, we'll let you know. Well, there's a study about various elite newspapers and their director's participation in these organizations. And as you see here, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, and the Committee for Economic Development, all top elite organizations, have a very definite number, a good number of links with these uh, newspapers. The Business Roundtable, the Committee on Present Danger, Foreign Policy Association, Ad Council, the Chamber of Commerce, etc., the directors of these top American establishment newspapers also participate in these organizations, as we can see. All of the links with the elite organizations add up to 100. In other words, 100 directors on these establishment newspapers do participate in the elite cartel, ruling cartel organizations. Well, what about the Bilderbergers? Here's a chart, maybe a little confusing, but a chart that shows the top establishment publications, such as the New York Times and all, and it shows the participation in the Bilderbergers from 1955 on. Now, each one of these numbers indicates there was one participant of a particular type during the particular specified years. So we can see there was a lot of participation in the Bilderbergers from these various publications, but did you see anything written about it? Very, very little, and absolute nothing on the uh, television networks. Here's a continuation of that same chart from 1971 through 1978. Now notice there are only about half of the years represented there. The list of the participants has not been recovered for these other years, so we really don't know. Undoubtedly it would be considerably greater number of people participating. But as you can see from this chart, the same publications participate year after year mostly people high in authority in the newspapers, uh, particularly for the television networks. There are a few trusted people, but now you can see the totals, which add up to 51 people in the Bilderberg organization who are from the mass media. But do they tell you all about this important organization? Seldom, very, very seldom. Here we can see the participation in the Trilateral Commission, and it's the same story the same organizations, the same high executives and directors participating. So, how about that watchdog? Which dog are they watching anyway? They're certainly watching the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, and the Council on Foreign Relations, but they're sure not reporting on them. The media are part of the power structure, just like the other organizations we've been talking about. Their societal purpose is to inculcate and defend the economic and social and political agenda of the privileged groups that dominate the domestic society. And they do this in all sorts of ways. They do it by selection of topics, by distribution of concern, by the way they frame issues, by filtering of information, uh, by emphasis and tone, by simple fabrication sometimes, but crucially by the bounding of debate to make sure that it doesn't go outside of certain limits. 
uh, the bounding both in the news columns and in the opinion columns, because, of course, the news columns themselves embody all sorts of assumptions and ideological presuppositions and so on. There are a whole set of mechanisms that legitimate some opinions and make other opinions seem far out or not worth studying. The, ma the mass media do this, too. My studies of the mass media, I find that once this policy has been set, that the media will follow up on this and you will not find any discussion on anything on the other side mm -hmm. of this yeah. preset agenda by these people you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Or if it is discussed, it's highly criticized, but generally it's just ignored. Mm -hmm. To the extent that there is a liberal bias, uh, it serves primarily to bound thinkable thought. Uh, that is to instill the unchallengeable assumptions uh, which in fact reflect this rather narrow elite consensus. So the liberal bias performs a real function. It says thus far and no further. I'm as far as you can go, and I go as far, how, I, how far I go is still accepting the basic presuppositions as unchallengeable. Now within those bounds, there's ample controversy, uh, and it reflects the tactical divisions uh, among elites over how to achieve generally shared aims, uh, but these limits are very rarely transcended. So the media thus function in accordance with what uh, my co-author Edward Herman and I have called a propaganda model in a recent book. Uh, that's another view. Well, uh, the, prop the propaganda model has a lot of predictions. It has a lot of predictions about how the press is going to behave, but it also has a further prediction. Uh, the further prediction is that no matter how well confirmed the propaganda model is, it cannot be taken seriously and therefore must be effectively excluded from mainstream discussion. And that actually follows from the model itself. The reason is that the model, if you think it through, the model uh, rejects certain principles that are serviceable to power. That is, it falls outside the spectrum uh, defined by the presupposition that the media are adversarial and cantankerous, perhaps excessively so. Now that presupposition is a useful one. It's serviceable to the interests of established institutions to believe that what you're reading is actually criticism if it's in fact support. That's a technique, it's a sophisticated technique of indoctrination. Uh, and of course, it's very serviceable to the media themselves. It's nice to think that you're, um, you know, pride yourself on being an independent and courageous uh, uh, adversary of power. And since those assumptions are serviceable, they're going to be upheld according to the propaganda model and no serious challenge will be permitted. Notice here I'm talking about what some might call the agenda-setting media, the media that set the frame that others adapt to. And that's a pretty narrow group. It's primarily the New York Times and the Washington Post and the three television channels and a couple of others. It's not much else. Those set the framework that everyone else pretty well adapts to uh, within anything like the mainstream. So we're talking about the agenda-setting media, and ask yourself what they are. Well, what they are is very large corporations. Uh, in fact, they're integrated with, uh, often owned by even larger conglomerates. Now, like other businesses, they have a product that they sell to a market. Uh, the market is advertisers, other businesses, and the product is audiences. Uh, the media don't finance themselves on their audiences. In fact, the audiences are usually a loss. The more you subscribe, the more the newspaper loses money. And of course, the television set, you know, they make anything when you turn it on. Uh, they make their money from advertisers. Advertising rates go up if you have a, the right kind of audience. Incidentally, a relatively privileged audience raises advertising rates. Uh, so what the media are, just as an institution, is major corporations selling relatively privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, what would you expect to come out of such a system? you expect to come out something that reflects the interests of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. That wouldn't be very surprising. In fact, it would be amazing if it weren't true. Uh, quite apart from that, there are many other things pressing in the same direction. There are, after all, centers of power in the society, I mean, the state, you know, the corporate sector, and others, and they can impose punishments for if things go wrong and re offer rewards if things go right. You gain by adapting to them. It's less costly. Uh, uh, and so on. Furthermore, the top managerial positions in the uh, media, uh, editors and columnists and so on, uh, if you make it into those positions, you're part of the privileged elite. 
part of the very top, in fact. But since you're both journalists, what your evaluation of the mass media and all these stories that we've been talking about? You know, the way they operate is, is, is that they're, they're going to follow the leader, you know, and they're, they're going to go with what the official story in Washington is so many times and what somebody, some government official hands them a document. And it's very rare that you get independent digging. And uh, it's a shame. Most, most journalists are, are not investigators, they're stenographers. They go to the press conference, they find out what the, the, the official opinion is, and they might get some, some balancing quotes from, from, some, from a dissenting view. And, that, and that's the extent of the investigation, to go out and actually independently analyze what the, what the real situation is, who's pulling the strings, where the money went. These questions go virtually unasked. And as long as they dominate the debate, they are uh, set the agenda, the debate remains in a fairly narrow frame work and, and is just not uh, widely discussed in, in, the, in the mass population. I, I liken it to a sort of a puppet show. And this is the way I look at the way the media, uh, the, you've got a puppet show here and the puppets are dancing and they're making shadows on the wall. <laughs> and what the public gets is a reporter sitting in the audience describing the shadows on the wall. That's sort of what we get. What's really happening is the shadows in the wall are being made by puppets who are being manipulated by puppeteers who are being told what to do by the puppet master behind the curtain. You know, and, and that's the way I kind of look at it. And, and you know, what we need to do is find the puppet master you know, and describe how it all works instead of just describing the shadows on the wall. And somehow that, I think that's the way the government works too. The real rulers in Washington are invisible and exercise power from behind the scenes. Felix Frankfurter, Supreme Court Justice. You're watching Alternative Views, spotlighting the U.S. power structure. We turn now to elections. Free and fair elections are cornerstones of democracy. Are they controlled like the rest of our political institutions? Americans are used to thinking, well, if there's a power structure, we wouldn't even be allowed to be in politics. But in America, you're allowed to run for president. You can run for anything you want. There's just one thing. You better have several million dollars or access to people that, that have several million dollars. So you see, we can say on the one hand, well, it's very fair. Anybody can run. But, in fact, not anybody can when you get down to the specifics of the matter. So we have a formally open and liberal system, but in practice, the way things work out is that the rich get richer uh, and they are able to continue a set of policies that, uh, that maximize their advantages. Uh, it's, it is also the case we can see it, we can all name some, that there are elected officials in the United States who are not part of the power elite. And they very often do oppose uh, uh, their positions. So I have no doubt there are pro-labor, there are pro-environmental, there are very liberal elected officials at, at various levels in our society, and that does create then real conflict. So that uh, my, my point would be, it's not that there aren't such people there. My point is, they usually lose, just as you say. With, I mean, in effect, if we look at the FCC or if we look at the FTC, if we look at various kinds of attempts to create, for instance, a consumer protection agency with some teeth, OSHA, what happens is OSHA we, OSHA, OSHA, that, that, we, that we eventually lose. They grind us down. And they grind us down because they have this institutional base behind them. They have more staying power. Listen, the American people have been conditioned that it's great to have two parties. We don't want to be like Italy where there's all these choices. We want to limit our choices. It's easier that way. And we don't want to be like the Soviet Union where there's only one party. Yeah, that's right. So they have two. But if policies never change, what's the difference? So we do have one party. There's policies never change. But you could easily have two conservative parties here that might compete for years with steadily diminishing voter turnout. I mean, this is, after all, what happened in the 70s, right? I mean, uh, uh, voter turnout just goes down, 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 and the sort of normal Democratic voter doesn't get a message. 
don't worry about whether you're voting for Democrats or Republicans. Both of them are controlled by industry. Uh, the personalities are different. Uh, Nixon is different from uh, McGovern, but uh, the policies that you'll get will be exactly the same. We came in by buses, the delegates in enormous convoys, and the buses, as we turned into the stockyard, there was a huge sign that said, uh, sheep and cattle to the right, hogs and goats to the left, and of course we followed the sheep and cattle. As soon as I arrived, I, I knew what it was like to be a cow in, in Chicago. I mean, you walked into a pen, and uh, you couldn't get out. It was a feeling of brutality. That's before there was any demonstration in the streets and before there was any real trouble. Uh, it was clear that the government was frightened. It's as close as I've ever gotten to the Berlin Wall in the United States. Uh, they were trying to keep the people or something coming emanating from the United States out of this area. Uh, it was the professional fencing himself in so they could carry on this game. They were all being led like sheep to the slaughter in their own private opinion. The brutality of it all is what struck me powerfully. And the, uh, there was an overriding sense that uh, no human voice could be raised against this successfully. It is a, it is a show. It's a piece of theater. It's rehearsed in advance and it takes place on time. The real market in American elections is not voters, it is major investors. Well, the golden rule, those who have the gold rule. If we look at the history of any politician, any politician in America that rises to the very top, that what we find is that at a certain point in their career, they become very involved with uh, the people that we're talking about here. Uh, and, the, and that the upper class becomes essential to that politician in terms of the financing of his or her campaigns. And that means things like uh, financing their travel, uh, giving them money in advance so they can schedule all their television time, um, giving them the kind of money that uh, allows them to hire experts. And basically then it gives any politician that gives, gets involved with these people a leg up. Structurally, it seems to me what's happened is the high cost of, the high cost of technology and, and the access to television running for president and running for Congress and running for any office has caused both parties to be penetrated and overwhelmed by large contributors. Now, both parties rely a lot on small contributors, but, they, but the small contributors don't get any access to the candidates. The large contributors do. And these politicians are not going to have uh, a set of, of policy uh, stances that are going to be uh, inimical to, uh, to uh, the uh, ruling group. We have a vote, but no choice, without which we have no voice. Republicans or Rocketcrats are all controlled by the same fat cats. We're fooled while they continue to rejoice. This establishment, this party uh, that we have, the single party state, this fraternity that runs this country that has two chapters, a Republican and a Democrat, one a little bit more uh, liberal than the other one, one more conservative representing the, the big business interests more directly, that's the Republicans. In terms of their interests, that's the A team. But they always have the B team that they can run out. A Jimmy Carter, when uh, Richard Nixon makes the nation too angry, or the nation gets too riled at the Vietnam War, or something like that. This is where they produced Michael Dukakis. He's a team player to the establishment. Uh, in order to be accepted as a presidential candidate, he did homage to the, to the arms race. Uh, he said eventually that he would give uh, humanitarian aid to the Contras, he would consider it. He said definitely he would give uh, military aid to El Salvador, which means he bought into all the principles of the covert secret government, of the covert operations, of the covert manipulation of the world. He was singing another song when he was trying to get the Democratic nomination. That's right. Before, his background was progressive, but he, he bought in, they screened him into the system, they groomed him into the system. He was advised that he could run, but if he would... So what he was there is he, if the nation had clung, had its outrage had been sufficient over the Iran-Contra scandal, they had Dukakis standing by. The B team to their interests, 
uh, and he would give them some grief by spending some money on housing and on, on medical insurance for people and things like that, uh, which is not their choice of the way to invest the money. They want to invest it in missiles and things where they make greater profits, but he would support the arms race and he would support the CIA and the, the covert establishment, the National Security State's activities. But then they realized they did not have to go with the B-team. The people didn't care. They didn't have to give the, the nation a B-team. So they went ahead and went with the A-team, which was George Bush, i.e., they concluded eventually that they could Teflonize Bush despite all of this incredible activity and sell him to the nation, and they did. Mm. We do have a pluralistic society, but we do not have a pluralistic economic and political structure. I think that's excellent. I think that uh, we, I think we have the uh, paradox over the last 20 years that a lot of the social movements that have happened, a lot of the events have made in some way, in some ways this a very open society at the individual, personal uh, kind of level, mm -hmm. and yet I continue to believe we have the same corporate power structure. And I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction in terms that, that uh, m my access to certain kind of information, my right to do things as an individual, which is a very important part of liberalism, that that could be increased in the society. And it has been for, for minorities, for women, for gays, for handicapped. Uh, those kinds of liberal individual freedoms could actually be in some way increased, and we could still be relatively powerless. I care not what puppet is placed on the throne of England to rule the empire. The man that controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire. And I control the money supply. Baron Nathan Meyer de Rothschild. The amoral pursuit of profits by international capitalism is shown by the behavior of major U.S. corporations just before and during World War II. You might have remembered just passing mention back in, there was a book that was published back in 1983 by Charles Higgum called Trading with the Enemy. It's subtitled An Exposure of the Nazi American Money Plot from 1933 to 1949. It was pretty obvious that many of, uh, of our own Corporations in this country provided essential aid to the Axis forces in the Second World War. And uh, many of the technological improvements that uh, led to many of the early victories of, uh, of the Nazis in Europe and to the death of the working class in this country were the direct result of uh, our multinational corporations selling uh, technological secrets to the Axis forces through neutral countries such as Switzerland. Exxon, then known as Standard Oil, uh, selling uh, gasoline and fuel cheaper to Japan and BC France than it did the United States Navy during World War II. And other things like subsidiaries of um, General Motors continuing to sell trucks to Nazi Germany up until as late as 1943 from their foreign uh, um, subsidiaries. And an amazing statistic I saw in another article saying that every bomb that was dropped on England during World War II was released by a bomber, by a plane which is made in an American plant in Germany. Wow. <laughs> the financing of Hitler was very important to the development and stability of the Third Reich, both before and during the war. The U.S. bankers and the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland provided this support. Well, you wonder why did these people collaborate with Germany? Well, if you read the press back in those days, you find that there was a lot of sympathy, an awful lot of sympathy for Nazi Germany and fascist Italy on the part of the American business elite. Plus the fact that they agreed with a lot of, the, of Hitler's racial ideas, particularly uh, concerning anti-Semitism. Well, so what are some of these things they did, the American companies did with the Germans? Well, they shared patents with them. They, uh, included the secret shipment of oil and aircraft production data, photographs, blueprints of military and naval bases, enough material on weapons to give Germans a clear picture of American armaments, as well as Alaskan and Northwest defense systems that we had. They sent oil to Spain and Vichy France, which was reshipped to the Nazis. They even refueled German tankers and U-boats, supplying tetraethyl lead, which was necessary for 
uh, aviation gasoline to Germany and Japan. This is during the while the war was going on. We were fighting these guys. They manufactured in subsidiary companies uh, abroad an array of communication and electronic equipment that helped the German develop artillery fuses, rocket bombs, and radio technology. They maintained crucial radio limit links to enemy nations in Latin America for intelligence transmissions. They supplied funds to the Axis via Southern Hemisphere sales. One of the big aircraft corporations building Focke Wolves for Hitler at the same time they were building P-38s or whatever it was for the American Air Force, you know, couldn't lose because they had money invested on both sides. Here's what a Senate subcommittee on antitrust and monopoly had to say about it. DuPont also owned shares in a number of important Axis firms. Had the Nazis won, General Motors would have appeared impeccably Nazi. As Hitler lost, these companies were able to re-emerge impeccably American. In either case, the viability of these corporations and the interests of their respective stockholders would have been preserved. They also made and repaired trucks for German occupation army in France, supplied ball bearings, etc., etc. And this is an interesting kicker here. They cooperated closely in financial matters through Chase Bank in Paris. And that's David Rockefeller's, it's the Rockefeller Bank, of course, Chase Bank, now known as Chase Manhattan Bank, and also with the Bank for International Settlements. Some of these co companies, well, Chase, of course, we mentioned Ford, Texaco, Standard Oil, New Jersey, now known as Exxon, International Telephone and Telegraph, General Motors, and some others. Uh, Rockefeller, mm, yeah. Morgan, a bell. Ford. A bell, yeah. yeah, a lot of them, yeah. most of them. And here are some others, Douglas Aircraft, Electric Boat, General Electric, Alcoa, United Aircraft, General Motors. In 1936, there was a munitions hearing by the United States Senate to indict Lockheed, DuPont, uh, Electric Boat, who makes all the submarines, DuPont because of their buildup of trucks and um, cars in the uh, Nazi regime. Let me not leave out um, Rockefeller. That is, we were rearming Germany to fight the United States. It became clear after the war that the situation of supranational interests, for example, led to the fact that certain industries were not attacked in Germany, that had actually been of great importance to the war economy and therefore should have been primary targets. During the bombings in the Second World War, which industries, which factories were not touched by bombs from either side? IG Farben, as you say, but I don't know what IG Farben plants were not also destroyed somewhere. General Motors, Opel, Ford. There will also be proof of the opposite. But in the grand total, it will be true that plants that were backed by American capital were struck less than others. I, I toured the Ford plant in Cologne in 71. And this place was built like in the 30s. The place was never damaged during the war, it was never bombed. And if by accident a, uh, one of these factories was bombed, war reparations were paid to these U.S. corporations, usually by the United States government. They won both ways. And to tie it all up, at the end of the war, people who collaborated with the enemy, the American, powerful Americans, they went into Germany and they were appointed as the top occupation advisor. John J. McCloy, who was a top man at Chase Manhattan Bank, as well as the Ford Foundation, was named the administrator of Germany at that time. He was considered at that time to be the number one man in the American power structure. Uh, and later this was changed and David Rockefeller took over. This shows that the interests of finance capital are effective beyond the borders of warring nations and thereby represent uncontrollable and sinister powers that have to be destroyed in the interests of the peoples. Do you think people need to get on the streets? That's the only place left for us to get together and show how we feel. Uh, it, it seems that the, the real legitimate ways to do it have been kind of blocked by politicians sometimes, sometimes by people who have money interests and things that uh, uh, make big profits for people who really don't care about other people's problems. There's no question about it that civil disobedience dramatizes your opposition. It's saying, I feel so strongly 
that the government is wrong, that I'm willing to uh, go to jail if uh, necessary in order to make this point. We've got a weapon. It's the only one. Use it on the big boy. Get them on the run. We've got to stop for the factory. Stop for the train. Stop what you're doing. Until the whole damn thing gets rearranged. When you look at the United States Congress, I don't think that you see a collection of leaders. You see, for the most part, 30 to 60 members of the Congress in both the House and the Senate collectively who are prepared to really, really seriously deal with this matter. That's why American people have got to go to the streets. This issue is too important to leave to the politicians. You're not alone. You can fight them on your own. We all decide to fight, we could get it done, make them feel our might. We've got to be united, we've got to be strong. They're gonna try to scare us, but we all got to, got to hold on. We'll stop all those factories, stop all the trains, stop what you're doing. My feeling is, of course, that the, uh, the very fundamental changes have got to be made, that we've got to have a less competitive, uh, more cooperative society. And I think there's a growing number of uh, people who feel that way. Why, it's too bad that you have to have a war in Vietnam or a policy as drastically wrong as I considered Reagan's a policy before any substantial no number of people uh, wake up and uh, at least wake up enough to uh, become active in any way. The hours get late And every trick they pull Gets us closer to destruction We can't play the fool We got a weapon It's the only one Use it on the big boy Get them on the run We got to Stop all those factories, stop all the trains, stop what you're doing, until the whole damn thing gets rearranged. Stop all those factories, stop all the trains, stop what you're doing, until the whole damn thing gets rearranged. Stop what you're doing. Until the whole damn thing gets rearranged. We have a lot of people to thank for helping make this production possible. Brian Lynch, Eric Eubank, Kevin L. West, and David Galisich. All were part of our production team over the years. And we're particularly appreciative of Jackson Brown, who let us use his lives in the balance, and Joan Harvey for taking sections of her wonderful documentaries, Voices in Descent, and America from Hitler to MX. Goodbye.